Over the last 50 years, we have scanned the skies with our radio telescopes for a signal from ET without success. But recently, some scientists have taken it upon themselves to transmit signals from Earth into space in the hope that aliens will detect us. But the big question is, who has the right to speak for Earth? Should people be allowed to send messages into the cosmos without consulting the rest of us? This debate reached new levels of urgency with the discovery of a potentially habitable planet in the Gliese 581 system in September 2010, just 20 and a half light years away. In 2008 and 2009, Dr. Alexander Zaitsev of the Russian Academy of Sciences in Moscow transmitted two messages to the Gliese 501 system. If there are any intelligent life forms in the system, we would hear back from them around the year 2050. But as Professor Stephen Hawking has warned, extraterrestrials might not be friendly. What are the dangers of opening hailing frequencies with ET? A recent conference held by the Royal Society at their new Cavley Centre at Chicherley Hall in Buckinghamshire, England, set out to tackle this issue, with participants from both sides of the debate, including Zaitsev, the SETI Institute's Dr. Seth Shostak, and science fiction author and astronomer David Brin. The result was a fascinating, if at times, fiery discussion. Well, the argument is that signaling our presence could provoke hostile aliens with dire consequences. Now, this is speculative. Of course it's speculative, because, in fact, our data set on alien sociology, which is what we're invoking here, is sparse. Look, I'm not saying that all contact is dangerous. What I'm saying is, should we not, in discussing this contact, be bringing in our best sages? Should we not be bringing in historians, biologists, anthropologists? And yes, there's the possibility that they may ask for a moratorium. That should not frighten us. So the suggestion that we should somehow limit our activities in this area might sound like a reasonable idea, a prudent caution, an ounce of prevention. It is not. It is a straitjacket for our species that will never be taken off. How can we know whether aliens are detecting our signals and picking up episodes of Coronation Street? What became apparent during the debate is there is no firm consensus as to how strong our transmissions really are. To begin with, what we've already sent out is not weak. It really, not all of it is weak. Ordinary leakage, yes, the television signals are weak. The amount of power in the, in the carrier waves of our analog television signals is roughly one quarter of the total power. That's a very narrow band signal. And you can work out what sort of an antenna would be required to pick that up at what distance. And Jim is right. With the current sort of equipment we have, it's on the order of a light year. Okay? I mean, there are the people who are building the, 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 this telescope LOFAR here in Europe who claim they're going to eavesdrop on ET's television. Well, that's only going to work if ET's television is a heck of a lot stronger than our television. I agree with that. I already pointed out that our most powerful radars could be found at tens of light years, possibly hundreds of light years. A simple calculation for Arecibo will show you that you can detect that with another Arecibo at 500 light years. And within 500 light years, there are several hundred thousand star systems. Are we going to shut these down? As for interplanetary radars, they are in fact directed at asteroids, not the stars, and are unlikely to be seen by nearby untargeted stars. Now, the, the radars are directed, of course, in the plane of the ecliptic where the planets and the asteroids are, a very narrow, about a half a degree wide band, typically, uh, in, if you were looking from afar. Uh, the, and if you, if you look at, go out at night, even if the night's clear, go out and look for the nearby stars. You can even, you see them even in England. The, uh, <laughs> the, uh, there's not much to be seen, frankly, in the near range. There aren't that many stars. And if you want to get an idea of the chance of those radars being seen by the stars, just think of the ratio of how much of the sky you see is covered by those stars, as opposed to all the black space in between. That's the factor you have to take into account, that that's not, uh, uh, the, there's a tremendous reduction of the possibility. What's more, once a radar is looking at a, a, uh, an asteroid and plots its course, it goes on to other asteroids. So you won't be seeing it again. The reproducibility is a big factor in trying to detect something. If you never see it come back again, you tend to forget it. So I would say, basically, we haven't really announced ourselves through leakage radiation. Seth Chostak's argument is that the cat is already out of the bag. Our radio signals are already detectable to BT if they have big enough telescopes. 
Earth's biosignatures are also already visible, and any dangerous aliens out there would surely have the technology to detect us, whether we are deliberately transmitting or not. However, those that are concerned, like David Brin, believe that we shouldn't make assumptions as to whether ET have detected us yet, or whether they will be good or bad. He admits that the risk to humanity is low, but shouldn't we first discuss whether to transmit before beaming willy-nilly into the cosmos? We find this fascinating. But we are also aware that in human history, in the history of this planet, almost every time one group that had never had any contact with the other has come in contact with the other groups, unwarranted assumptions tended to res result in somebody being very unhappy. But what has happened is we've been entering into a new era in which we are facing an expansion of the field called risk analysis. And one of the most important areas of risk analysis is dealing with what do you do about low probability, high impact phenomena. Things that might be improbable, but if you rank, the, rank all these endeavors next to each other and say 0 0.9, 0 0.9, 0 0.9, 0 0.9, 0 0.9, your chance of surviving if you do all of these things without pre-discussion is nil. At the end of the debate, there was no clear winner which can guarantee that this argument will carry on and on. This is Gemma Lavender, Astronomy Now, signing off.